Do you remember what has happened in the world in 2020? Think about the news you've watched. When I think about the news of 2020, I mostly think of COVID, Trump, and then Trump getting COVID. But is that really all that happened? What happened to the wildfires in the world? In Australia, California, the Amazon? Or different conflicts in Syria, Yemen, or recently Azerbaijan? How did these events disappear from our radar so quickly? Or maybe never even made it to our radar at all? The medium is the message. Whatever message you want to hear, as a liberal person, you better watch CNN. Whatever message you want, as a conservative, you go to Fox News. I don't know how that makes me a better journalist than my generation. When I was a child, we would always eat at 5.30 p.m. sharp so we could make the 6 p.m. news. We would get a quick digest of what was happening around the world or what newsmakers thought was important around the world. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. A 10 to 15 minute summary followed by what Dutch people really think is important, the weather forecast. Today, news is everywhere. On the one hand, I feel more knowledgeable and can choose where and when to consume news. But at the same time, there's no way to escape. The moment I open up my phone or my laptop, I'm bombarded with stories, opinions, and half as analyses of what's happening and why. As a creator myself, I can't help but feel that media has become a commodity. In this series, I want to take a deeper look at how news is made and how the media landscape has become so polarized. Let's consider a brief history of the news. A few hundred years ago, news publications were mostly a means of communication for the aristocracy. For example, the king or church could communicate with their followers. But as more news publications became readily available, the idea of a more neutral reporting came about. Now, this wasn't because of any journalistic ethos or morale, but really because of advertising. Newspapers weren't just about educating the masses, they were also about making lots of money. Penny paper owner Benjamin H. Day printed this motto atop every issue of the New York Sun. The object of this paper is to lay before the public, at a price within the means of everyone, all the news of the day, and at the same time offer an advantageous medium for advertisements. Because as the press grew into a full-fledged industry, advertising became the largest source of media revenue. Today's news today. Produced for Camel Cigarettes by NBC. As a result, having a narrow audience with a specific political slant was a business liability. Without the targeted audiences of today, news had to be appealing to as many readers or viewers as possible. Because after all, advertising was the largest source of media revenue. What changed over time is that it became in the interest of the newspapers particularly to appeal to a larger audience. That means you didn't want just the left or the right, you wanted both. And so that created a tradition, uh, along with a few other things, where there was an attempt to give just the facts, a kind of middle-of-the-road perspective. Now, the elite media are the sort of the agenda-setting media. That means the New York Times, the Washington Post, the major television channels, and so on. They set the general framework. The local media more or less adapt to their structure. In Manufacturing Consent, Noam Chomsky and Edward Herman challenged the idea that media acts as a check on political power and serves the public, and instead argue that most media is really just part of a propaganda machine. And according to Herman and Chomsky, much of what we are served as objective news is just propaganda for the powerful. They determine, they select, they shape, they control, they restrict, uh, in order to serve the interests of dominant elite groups in the society. So what about today? Well, the idea of neutral reporting, that seems to have been thrown out of the window. Today, the media landscape seems more polarized than ever, and as consumers, we have preferred sources and publications that we choose to consume. But the underlying mechanism remains the same. News publications are selling a product, and the product is you. So while Fox News is appealing to a conservative base, they want to appeal to the widest conservative base they can and hopefully attract high earners among that base who will drop money on their advertisers' products. CNN similarly wants to attract a wide audience while not alienating their well-to-do viewers who are so lucrative to their bottom line. Just a few decades ago, it was of commercial interest to have as large an audience as possible. But with the rise of the internet, social platforms, and AI, 
the game has changed completely. To understand how these factors play out, I spoke with different journalists working out of Istanbul. I asked them how they feel about the media landscape today. Just to watch the news, especially now, we're more polarized than ever from Fox News to MSNBC or whether in Turkey or in the UK or Russia. I write a pitch and I pitch it to my platform. My platform then decides if this is, this is of interest to them. The freedom is based on what the market is, really. It's really about what editors in America or editors in the UK, I write for the English-speaking press, what they want often. I mean, that's the reality of the situation. I choose my stories based on my own interest, and that's the beauty of being a freelancer. The stories a journalist works on are restricted by the platform they're working for, as well as politics, budget, advertising. Coming up. The upper body is still. Oh no, I get what you're saying. Yeah. You, the 20 seconds on screen, is the upper part of exactly, the duck. Yeah, exactly. And the part underwater. You see whatever's happening below that you don't see. <laughs> that you don't yeah. see. <laughs> now, a freelance journalist may be a bit more free in choosing what they cover or what they don't cover, but they're still very much impacted by the commercialization of news media. The way journalism has been streamlined on the platform, which is the kind of stories that, that such platforms run is designed to feed a, a certain kind of audience. And so there's a kind of story I can pitch to a Fox platform that will be, you know, accepted because that's what the audience wants to hear. People want to consume media, it seems, more and more that ticks their boxes and fits their objectives and opinions about life in the world, rather than hearing sort of opposing ideologies and then making that challenge their thoughts. That's one of the downsides of everyone consuming news in their bubble. You don't get the news, you get your news. And so when you meet a liberal person, a Democrat or a Republican, it's like they're living in two different countries. But you could never get those two to agree because they're feeding from two different sources. This is the truth differently. So it seems that we mostly consume news that already fits our existing beliefs. When I scroll down my Twitter, Facebook, or another social feed, I mostly see things I agree with, or things that I so much disagree with, it just makes me angry. Both sides are always talking about the other side, so this kind of sets up this us versus them narrative. Rather than, you know, the, the old villains of the past, now the new villain, Matt Taibbi's thesis here, is each other, right? So it's yeah. all about cheerleading for your team, the, the, you know, the flip side of the story is always that side is bad, this side is good, every day, all day long, and I think people are just getting tired of it, frankly. Now let's look at an example. What about media coverage about migration? So yeah, when I first started covering migration and refugee flows to the EU, I mean, from Turkey to Greece, the numbers were maybe 150 a day at most in, back in 2010, and that was shocking for people in those border villages in Greece. Because in 2015, many people uh, went to Europe from Turkey by sea. It was almost one million people, and it wasn't only Syrians. It was also Afghans, Iranians, Iraqis. And I think this is when we started to call this a refugee crisis, because it arrived at the borders of Europe. We don't talk about Yemen. We don't talk about Sudan. I think this is where crisis comes from, the Eurocentrism of the field of migration and asylum, actually. Europe's migrant crisis is getting worse by the day. A migrant crisis spiraling out of control. Hundreds of thousands of asylum seekers are risking everything. A human wave washing over Europe's southern shores. Hundreds of thousands of migrants have streamed into Europe. When we receive news from, from the Middle East, it's always from the European or American perspective. Between Latin America and Middle East, we don't have a direct channel of connection. The current dynamics of how we receive news about this part of the world means that there's just an incentive to import the breaking news happening in, in the Middle East. Say terrorism, say extremism, you know, like bombs. And it just gives a bad perception of what's happening here. The world is, in fact, getting more global. It's getting more connected. More of our problems are global in scale. More of our economics is global in scale. And our media is less global by the day. Most American outlets want some kind of American angle in order to cover that story, to care about the story. For me, this is a problematic lens to look at the news. Because we're global now, we need to look beyond those borders. We need to actually connect the dots with people globally. 
If you watched a television broadcast in the United States in the 1970s, 35 to 40 percent of it would have been international news, a nightly news broadcast. That's down to about 12 to 15 percent. And this tends to give us a very distorted view of the world. Even with a global audience, most media outlets are still based in the West, and that means that the West decides the narrative. The big media, and the biggest media still in the world is Western media. They've been there for a long time. There's a lot of investment, um, and because they've spent a long time in the, on the scene, people trust them, and as opposed to the fact that it is easy to find them, it's what you hear first before you hear every other person speak. 85% of the refugees are in developing countries. And I'm pretty sure that 85% of the news don't come from developing countries. We don't hear about Somalia or Sudan, Bangladesh, Turkey, Colombia. Well, you don't hear the part where Africa takes its own largest fair share of refugees. And the countries that don't even have the capacity to house those people are the ones doing it. This narrative, this crisis narrative that is reinforced by international organizations, by the media, I think it is misleading and it's even self-defeating. When you are dealing with a mass of people that large, you really want to be a little careful with how you describe them. Unfortunately, David Cameron recently referred to a swarm of people coming across the Mediterranean, and that language matters. When you look at news, what sells? Good news is not news. It's bad news. It's news when it's bad. Uh, when we see media talking about migrants, and talking about refugees, we always tend to gravitate towards the most extreme viewpoint. Especially in Europe, media tends to feed into negative public perceptions on, on refugees. Well, of course, the most prominent one that we've been facing is this relation of the migrants and refugees with terrorism. All the people, the TVs, they are like focusing on the war, and the shelling and the people dying. No one is like focusing on life of the refugees after all these years of crisis, how they are surviving. When there is no government, there is no income. We are taken as pawns in a bigger game. Like we don't have a voice. We're used for political gains, you know? Like if it's elections, then Trump says like, man, like all these guys are coming. But day by day, I saw that the media become political. They are just trying to show what their government or what their sponsors want to, especially in the Europe. They are just trying to show the migrants as they are in the camps. They have uh, nothing to do. They are just always waiting for the uh, help from the government, waiting for the, their needs to come to them. You know, this is part of the problem, actually. That's part of why there's so much xenophobia, because when you only hear about yourself and your own problems, you stop caring about the rest of the world. You think that people outside of those borders are so different, when in reality, when it comes to basic needs, they're not that different at all. So we need a more diverse reportage of migration, of refugee crisis, and just open it up a bit more so we can understand. It is clear that there's a lack of nuance, and I can see that the journalists I talk to really do want to create nuanced conversations. So what is stopping them? Well, we the consumer are part of the problem. We like free information. I mean, I hate paywalls too. But small companies and new initiatives cannot survive in a media landscape that is dominated by literally a handful of corporations. So to make the news requires money and to continue these outlets. So there have been so many good outlets, there's been so many new ventures, but a lot of them don't make it because of, of the expenses that you require. And so corporate media ends up winning almost every time because they have the backing. With such a massive concentration of wealth and power in the hands of so few, it all but ensures that smaller operations never have the chance to succeed. Every day we're getting budgets and getting caught. Stories are shifting around politics. <laughs> and this isn't even about like individual journalists yeah, right. and like, has, this is just the structure of this system is designed to boost corporate profits. That is the whole goal. Yeah. It's yeah. filler. The shows that you watch on cable news or whatever are filler between commercials of selling you whatever. Like that's what it is. But remember, one thing holds true, ratings and advertising. And what does that say? Money, money, money. Recently, the integrity of news has become harder to protect, particularly in print. Print is still where most original journalism is done. There is also this race to break the news for us, and that's the problem. We don't get that much 
360 view out these days anymore because we are pressed for time. There's race to give it to you as a viewer. But since papers moved online, they have struggled financially, mainly because news is like porn. People don't want to pay for it on the internet. So there's a constant struggle between employability, money, advertising, and stories that matter. This is the reality of 21st century journalism. Social media presents an extra obstacle. Most platforms like Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram are built to reward confirmation bias. Those companies want you in their apps as long as possible, so their algorithms are tuned to keep showing you stuff you like. If it's simple, easy to understand, and fills in the gaps for us, we are ready to believe. Technology gives us the impression that we can choose from multitude of perspective and that we are in control. But in reality, algorithms and AI are constantly at work to feed us articles and headlines that play into our emotions and make us click the most. When we find ourselves in an atmosphere we usually trust, like Facebook, for example, we're less likely to question the info we find. Plus, many of us only read headlines. 59% of links shared on social media aren't even clicked. We just share away without a second thought. The reality of clickbait is a very heavy one on every media organization, whether it's an independent one, because you want to survive. You want as many listeners and readers as possible. In order to grab our attention, because there's so much competition, design has to appeal to the lower parts of us, to the kind of uh, non-rational, uh, automatic, impulsive parts of us. And so this is why we get things like clickbait, like sensationalism, things that appeal to our outrage. You know, at the end of the day, they're advertising systems, not really social platforms. Unfortunately, what I'm seeing is sort of a dumbing down uh, of, of the news more and more and more. As, as we get more information, people have stopped sort of reading and younger people just want to click on videos. Technology is advancing at an incredibly fast pace, but can we keep up? Are we digitally illiterate? With things like native advertising and promoted posts, it becomes difficult to distinguish what is a news story and what is really just marketing. It's like with every new medium, we need new skills to navigate it all. The problem is that means the arguments are always containing flamboyant noise. And the people who want a calm, steady, measured conversation, well, they're, they're not getting read on social media. The term fake news has gotten a lot of attention over the last few years. And in 2016, post-truth was dubbed the word of the year by Oxford Dictionary. But is fake news a new phenomenon? I think it's a heightened version of propaganda is what it is because you have advancement in technologies. So what governments were doing before or corporations were doing now, everybody can do. It's become available to every individual who has access to a telephone, a smartphone, or a computer, and an account on Twitter or Facebook. Fake news really isn't so different from propaganda. It's just become amplified by the use of technology. This is serious stuff. It's not like it used to be, I think. And it's, it's become, like, hate speech was always there. But this is hate speech on steroids being spread in a matter of seconds. And it's having a serious impact. And you must have heard about deep fake, which is like, it is completely, it looks like the truth, but someone tweaked it a little bit. And it is intended to mislead. Now, fake news is not the only way that the media misleads the public. You can mislead by giving false information, by giving no information, or by giving way too much information. There are two ways, maybe, to keep a population passive, resigned, despairing, accepting of whatever status quo is given to them. The first way to keep the population down, I think, is the way that's been tried in North Korea. Stop all news. That's one way. But there's another, more insidious, cleverer way. Flood the people with news. Give them so much news, they can't remember what was going on yesterday. I mean, who can remember here what was happening in the news uh, last week? This time last week. Who knows? I mean, it's a prehistory. No one can remember. So most people are actually aware that their news is not free of any bias. So where does this idea of objective and neutral reporting even come from? I'll be taking a look at that in our next episode. Thanks for watching! You might also like our after show where we go more into our own opinions and talk about the process of making this series. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel for more content.